Welcome to a very normal Therapeutics employee training video. In this video, we'll be covering linear regression. If you're a new employee of my made-up pharma company, then welcome. My name's Christian, and this is Very Normal, a channel for making you better at statistics. This video is a part of a bigger series of explainers for various statistical tools. My goal is to give you a better intuition of these tools without getting bogged down in too much technical detail. Before I start, I have to say that linear regression is a huge topic to cover. There are entire university courses dedicated to teaching it, but in this video I'm going to focus on the concepts that I think are the most important for people to know in order to actually use linear regression. In particular, I'm going to talk about how to interpret the different aspects of the model and how to approach the most important hypothesis test for linear regression. Linear regression represents the first time that we delve into relationships between variables. Okay, technically it's the second, but it's the first time we're dealing with an explicit relationship like this. Here we have some independent variable x, and we're interested in its relationship f with some dependent variable y. These two variables have a lot of names, so I'm just going to stick to covariate and outcome respectively. This variable denoted by epsilon represents random noise. The only thing we'll assume about the noise is that their expected value is zero, meaning that their general magnitude and direction generally cancel each other out when considered in aggregate, and that they have some constant variance. It's just some number. Unlike the slope and intercept model that we learn in school, which is a deterministic relationship, linear regression represents a stochastic relationship. Stochastic is nerd speak to describe something that's random. If we plug in a value for x into f, it won't exactly match the value of the outcome. So this epsilon term helps to fill in the gap. This epsilon is random, and it's what makes this relationship stochastic. The simplest form of linear regression looks like this. Sometimes you might see different subscripts here to index different observations, but I'll keep them out for simplicity. In simple linear regression, we only have an intercept and one non-intercept coefficient. But with multiple linear regression, we can have multiple non-intercept covariates. Linear regression gets its name from the fact that the outcome is linear in the parameters. For now, I'll focus on a single covariate. To make sense of the model, it's better to look at a graph. And for simplicity, I'm going to assume that x is binary, taking only 0 or 1 as values. When x is 0, we're left with this expression. This implies that the average outcome is centered at beta 0 and will vary around it according to the variance in the noise. We can isolate beta 0 by taking the expectation or average value of this whole expression. Mathematically speaking, this means that we can interpret beta 0 as the average outcome when the covariate is 0. This interpretation will change depending on what the covariate actually is, and I'll cover two examples in a bit. This brings us to beta 1. Beta 1 only remains in the model when the covariate is equal to 1, so we have this expression. Similar to what we saw before, this implies that when the covariate is 1, the average outcome is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1, and it can vary with variance sigma squared. Since the variance was a constant, the spread of the outcome stays the same no matter what the value of the covariate was. Notice that the only difference between these two instances is the fact that beta 1 shifts the average outcome by an additional amount. So beta 1 is the change in the average outcome associated with a unit increase in the covariate. You can see this by taking the difference in these two equations. This also means that beta 0, which is interpreted on the same scale as the outcome, is different from beta 1, which is interpreted as a change in the outcome. These are purely mathematical terms, so it's good to know how to translate these according to the problem you're working with. Here's two examples for practice. As a first example, let's say that x is a categorical variable which describes whether or not someone is on new blood pressure medication versus placebo. x is 0 when someone is on placebo, and 1 when they're on actual medication. The outcome is systolic blood pressure. This means that beta 0 represents the average blood pressure of someone in the placebo group. Beta 1 represents the change in the average blood pressure associated with being on the treatment group with respect to the placebo group. When the covariate is a categorical variable, a unit increase simply represents a change in group. One group is usually designated as the reference group, aka x equals 0, and in this case it was the placebo group. For a second example, we'll keep blood pressure as the outcome, but we'll change x to be the amount of exercise someone gets, measured in hours. That is, x is now continuous. In this case, beta 0 is the average blood pressure of someone who does no exercise. 
aka x equals zero. Beta 1 now represents the average change in blood pressure associated with an extra hour of exercise. When we shift from a single covariate to multiple covariates, the interpretations of the coefficients mostly remain the same, but with some small modifications. To see this, let's look at a model with three covariates, a categorical variable for treatment, another indicating if someone is male or not, and then hours of exercise. Same outcome as before. To isolate beta zero, all of the covariates in the model need to be zero, not just one of them. For this to happen, someone needs to be on placebo, be a woman, and then have no exercise. So beta zero represents the average outcome of someone who fits this description. Now let's say we want to isolate the coefficient associated with treatment. To do that, we can follow a similar strategy we did with simple linear regression. To compare the equations for the regression model when someone is on placebo versus when someone is on treatment. The added wrinkle here is that there are now two extra covariates that need to be canceled out. So to isolate the coefficient we want, the intercept and the other covariates need to cancel out. And this will only happen if the covariates are held constant in both equations. But what does that mean in more concrete terms? By requiring the other covariates to be constant, we interpret a single coefficient to be the average change in the outcome for a unit change in the covariate, holding the other covariates constant. Or more intuitively, among people sharing the same set of covariates. This might also be phrased as having adjusted for sex and hours of exercise. So when you hear adjusted for or held constant, that's usually a nod to the fact that some kind of regression was used. Based on what I've talked about, I hope it's more clear that the non-intercept coefficients are what capture the relationship between x and y. Because of this, they're often the main focus for a linear regression hypothesis test. And usually we're only interested in the coefficient for a specific covariate, like a treatment or a risk factor. For reference, I'll call this specific coefficient beta 1. Similar to what we did with past hypothesis tests, we'll cover it using the NHST framework. First up are the assumptions. There are actually a lot of assumptions that go on with linear regression. First is the fact that linear regression is a mathematical model. It's inherently an assumption on what the relationship between two variables looks like. In this case, a linear relationship. This model may seem simplistic, but it's very close to how we humans think. If you've ever said, the more the merrier, then that's a linearity assumption in action. Next, we also assume some things about the errors, that they had zero mean and constant variance. Notice I haven't made any distributional assumptions on the noise, but this will come up again in a little bit. The constant variance assumption is also known as homoscedasticity, like how I talked about in the ANOVA video. Another standard assumption is that the data we collect are from a random sample. That is, they're independent and identically distributed. This has been a standard assumption among the hypothesis tests we've learned, and it simply means that our observations should not influence each other. We also assume that the covariates are independent from the noise terms. Next up is the parameter of interest. We've already established that there's a particular coefficient that we want to test. But in linear regression, there are also other parameters that must be estimated as well. These are called nuisance parameters because we don't care about them, but we still have to estimate them along with the parameter of interest. There's nothing we can really do about it. And honestly, it doesn't even really affect this particular hypothesis test. With linear regression, beta 1 captures the relationship between the covariate of interest and the outcome. Any non-zero value for the coefficient counts as an association. I'm specifically saying association because, by itself, linear regression cannot identify a cause and effect relationship between x and y. To do that, you need to do some extra stuff, and you can hear more about that in these videos. So, the relevant null hypothesis is that beta 1 is equal to zero. And of course, the usual alternative is that it's not equal to zero. We need a way to estimate the parameters of the model. Before we show you how we do that, I have to warn you. Linear regression is much more complicated than past hypothesis tests we've dealt with on this channel. We're dealing with multiple random variables, a single outcome, possibly many covariates, and random noise. To keep the notation compact, it's better to write all these variables in terms of matrices. Y is now a column vector, meaning it has one column and n observations, where n is the sample size. X becomes a matrix. It has n rows and p plus 1 columns. Here, p describes the number of non-intercept coefficients. The added 1 represents the column for the intercept. 
In other sources, you may see that P represents all of the regression parameters. If you ever get confused, just remember that all of the parameters in the regression model get columns, and that this number of columns should represent the parameters in this vector here. The noise vector has similar dimensions to the outcome vector. This representation captures the fact that there's multiple observations and parameters all in a concise statement here, so that's why we use it. Without getting into the gritty details, we can estimate all of the regression coefficients simultaneously using the famous ordinary least squares estimators, for short, OLS. We don't directly observe what the epsilon terms are, but we can estimate them with something we call residuals, which we calculate by taking the OLS estimators and using them to see how far the model is from the actual outcome. By taking the variance of these residuals, we can get an estimate for sigma squared. The OLS estimators are statistics, so they're functions of random data. By extension, they're also random variables. The covariance matrix of the OLS estimators is given by this expression here. The variance of the noise multiplied by this inverse matrix here. It's a covariance matrix because we have to consider both the variances and the covariances of the estimated coefficients. But remember that we had to estimate the variance, so we replace it with its estimator sigma squared hat. I'm highlighting the covariance matrix here because it supplies us with the variances for each of the estimators. To construct the test statistic for the hypothesis test, we'll need both the estimated value for beta 1 and its corresponding standard deviation. Hopefully this might look a little familiar. Maybe if I bring up this equation and add a zero here, it might jog a few memories. This is the test statistic for testing beta 1, and it looks just like the test statistic for the one sample t-test. That's not by accident. Standardized statistics are extremely common, and they even have a special name, a Wald statistic, named after the statistician Abraham Wald. The last thing we need to do is figure out the null distribution for this statistic. If you've seen my videos on the t-test, you'll remember that the Wald statistic will either have a normal distribution or a t-distribution. The normal distribution comes from the estimator and the numerator. For the OLS estimator, we can get this normality through different assumptions. One assumption we can make is that the errors themselves are normally distributed. Earlier we had only made the assumption about its mean and variance, but this is a stronger assumption about its distribution. Another assumption we can make is that we have a large enough sample size such that we can assume a central limit theorem can apply to the estimate. I would say that most people assume they have a large enough sample size for asymptotics to kick in. Thanks to the properties of the normal distribution, this entire expression is a standard normal. But when we have to estimate the variance, as we have here, then we get a t-distribution. All we need to figure out is its degrees of freedom. Remember that from the one sample t-test that the t-statistic has a t-distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. We have to subtract 1 because a degree of freedom is spent estimating the sample mean from the data. A good rule of thumb for quickly checking the degrees of freedom for a Wald statistic is to check how many parameters you need to estimate from the data then you subtract this number from n. The number of parameters we need to estimate is p plus 1, so the corresponding degrees of freedom is n minus p minus 1. With all of these ingredients, we can perform a hypothesis test on beta 1. Let's see how we can do that in code. I've simulated a multiple linear regression with three terms, treatment, sex, and hours of exercise. You can see that all three covariates actually do shift the average outcome, but the specific values here aren't that important. To simulate the epsilon terms, I generate a random normal with the standard deviation of 10. Again, the value is not so important here. If we look at the data, it'll look just like a data set we might use in a real world analysis. To run the linear regression, we need to use the LM function. For a standard linear model, we only need to specify two things, the model specification and the data for estimating the parameters. R has a special notation for writing formulas using this tilde sign here. The outcome is on the left side, and we write out the non-intercept terms on the right. The LM function automatically assumes we want an intercept, so we don't have to write that out. If we run this and get a summary of the model, we'll see this. We'll just focus on this section here since I haven't taught you everything needed to interpret all of these results. This first column indicates the specific covariate, and this column has the OLS estimates for each of them. You can see that they're somewhat close to the true values I used, but I only used 30 observations, so you shouldn't expect them to be that close. Here are the standard deviations, or standard errors for each of these coefficients, and these come from the covariance matrix I mentioned earlier. 
after these are the test statistics and the corresponding p-values for them. To see where the degrees of freedom come, you can see right here. We have four parameters to estimate and 30 observations, so we have 26 degrees of freedom total. This was a quick explainer to linear regression. It's a huge topic, so I've only covered the basic interpretation and hypothesis test that we might use with it. Linear regression is important for statisticians to know because it provides a good cornerstone for learning more complex models. If you like this explainer, then please subscribe to the channel. I try to upload statistics content every two weeks and even more content through a newsletter. You can get new videos sent straight to your inbox. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.